السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك عليكم مني سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعله الله أخر الأحد مني لزياراتكم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلاة وسلام على محمد وأهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين صلوا على محمد قال الله تعالى في كتاب الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ذلك الذي يبشر الله عباده الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات قل لا أسألكم عليه أجرا إلا المودة في القربة الله سبحانه وتعالى in the famous ayat of مودة he says in surah 42 ayat 23 that is of which Allah gives the good news to his servants to those who believe and do good deeds Say, he's telling Prophet to say, I do not ask of you any reward for it, but the love of my near relatives. So normally when we see someone, they do a job. They expect to be compensated for what they do. The hours they put in, the dedication they put in, the hard work they put in, the studies that they put in, all for the task of whatever they were commissioned to do. <clears throat> they expect to do compensation for that. But when we see, when the people asked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam They came to the Prophet and they asked him, what do you want for, us, for giving us this message? What can we give to you? They were asking him to give him something. So this is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this verse that the response to their question was that they only Love Ahlul Bayt, alayhim wa salam. And we know that the position of prophethood of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi His position was the highest position in all of creation. From beginning of time to end of time, Prophet has the highest station, the seal of the prophets. So the salary for this, this position we would think that it would be the most because he has the highest position, the highest maqam in the, all of the creation. However, we see that money was not even asked for. We see that it was something greater than money, something that money can't even come close to. So what is the recompense for the whole of the entirety of Nubawa, of the Prophet? It was only the love of the Prophet And how high must Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hold that love of Ahlul Bayt? How high must that status be in the eyes of Allah? Because it was worth more than anything else in creation. He could have given, it's the highest position. So could have given him money, could have given him anything, land, whatever he wanted. But the highest thing to pay for the highest position was love of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. Money can't even come close to that. And we have this. Sometimes we think we're poor or we're broke or we don't have anything. We, we're without everything. But we have the most expensive thing in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have love of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. Not everyone has that tawfiq to love Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam and the Imams. Not everyone has that. We have to be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He blessed us to be able to recognize their rights, to be able to recognize that we have Imams, to be able to recognize that we have Imam Zaman ajallah ta'ala. And we have to make use of that. 
in our lives. We cannot take it for granted. As I said in the previous nights, the ayat that said, uh, Rasulullah said, if you love me, then follow me. If you love Allah, then follow me. So if we love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we want to show our love to Allah, we need to follow them. We, love, love needs some actions. If we say that we just love someone, and we don't do anything for them, we don't do any good actions for them, what is that love? Do we really love those people? Do we, what do we do? We have to ask ourselves, what do we do for Ahlul Bayt salam? What do we do in their cause to show appreciation for everything they have done for us? Another ayat Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Say, if your fathers and your sons and your brothers and your mates and your kinsfolk and your property which you have acquired and the slackness of trade which you fear and your houses which you like are dearer to you than Allah and His Messenger and striving in His way, then wait till Allah brings about His command and Allah does not guide the transgressing people. This is Surah 9, Ayat 24. So we see in this verse that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us that everything that we hold dear to us, such as our families, such as our friends, those things that keep us up at night, we're worrying about our business transactions, our bank statements, our business ups, our business downs, the property we acquired, the rental houses we, maybe we have, the cars we have, all of these things that keep us up at night, all of these things should not be more beloved than Allah and His Messenger and Ahlul Bayt How often do we lay at night and we stress and we think about all of these things? All these things, we lay in the bed, we worry, oh man, is my bank statement, is this money going to come out, am I going to overdraft, for example, or how do I pay my loans, or all of these other things. We worry about all sorts of things. But how often do we lay at night and wonder if we're living a life pleasing Allah and His Messenger and our Imam? We don't think about that too often. Not as much as we should, I don't think. And this, all this advice applies to me as well as everyone. We should take time and think about, are we living our life in a better way? Are we living our, our life in a way that if Imam came today, he would be pleased with us? This is how we have to think. Uh, Imam Ali alayhi salam said that the person whose days are the same is a loser because we're supposed to be not the same as yesterday. We're supposed to be better the next day. We're supposed to continue to improve. So at night we have to take account of ourselves. What did we do today? When we lay in the bed at night, what did we do today? Did we do things pleasing to Allah? Did we make mistakes? Maybe we made a sin, we made some mistakes, we didn't do everything perfect. We see that, look at that, evaluate it and say, I'm going to do better tomorrow. I'm going to work on this thing. But we have to recognize that we have the problem in order to work on it. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So we see that from these verses that the priority in life is loving Allah, loving His Messenger and the Holy Household. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't love other things like our families and our friends. Rather we shouldn't let the love of those things come above the love of Allah and His Messenger. And when we love our families, we love our friends, we're loving them for the sake of Allah. This is also in the cause of Allah. We all love each other here as brothers in Islam, as uh, Shias of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. All of this is uh, for the cause of Allah. So what the verses are saying is don't let that love of dunya and love of other things come above this love. Allah says in Surah 29, Ayah 8, And we have enjoined man goodness on man goodness to his parents. And if they contend with you that you should associate others with me, of which you have no knowledge, do not obey them. To me is your return, so I will inform you of what you do. So we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us to love and be good, love our parents, be good to our parents. But, ayat, as what they call in uh, nah, adat al shart, a condition, where it says in. After this, it tells you, I enjoin on you goodness to your parents, to love your parents, then the condition comes. If they don't tell you to associate others with Allah. So this is the red line. If they tell you to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
So we see that loving and obeying Allah comes above our love even for our parents and obedience to our parents. And we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this, He gives us condition because maybe our parents, they maybe make a mistake. Now the Bilal happens, our parents are not ma'asum. So Allah puts condition. But whereas we see where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, Ya ayyuhu ladina amanu, ata'iyu Allah wa ata'iyu Rasul wa ulul amra minkum. O you who believe, obey Allah and obey the Messenger and those in charge of authority amongst you, which is, we know, Ahlul Bayt There's no condition. No condition. The obedience to Ulul Amr Minkum is same as obedience to Prophet, which is obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the reason why there's no condition, because Allah commanded us to follow them, they are ma'soom. Allah would not command us to follow someone unconditionally if they made mistakes. So these people who, ulul amr minkum, those in charge of authority amongst you, they have to be ma'asumin. We see other people who held that position, they made a lot of mistakes. Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam came to their rescue many times where they said, if it wasn't for you, Ya Ali, I would be destroyed. Famous sayings. So we see that Allah would be unjust if He told us to obey someone unconditionally if they made mistakes. So this ayah, it proves that the, the ones who are commanded to obey are ma'asun, infallible. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says, O you who believe, stand out firmly for justice as a witness to Allah, even against yourselves or your parents or your kin whether it is against rich or poor. For Allah can best protect both. Follow not the lust of your heart, lest you swerve and you distort justice or decline to do justice. Verily, Allah is well acquainted with all you do. This is Surah 4, Ayat 135. So Allah is saying, stand up again for justice, even if it's against ourselves or our own parents. We don't let even ourselves get in the way of putting Allah and His Messenger and Ahlul Bayt first. So this is what we have to look at when we're building, when we're living our life, to build a life on loving Allah, loving His Messenger, loving Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. Put this as the main focus and everything else will fall in place. When we look at the life of the lives of the Prophet and the Imams alayhi salam, we always find that there's some extraordinary people that stand out from amongst their companions. I have people like Salman, people like Abu Dhar, people like Maytham al-Tamar, and others. One of these individuals that built his life on loving Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam that I want to talk about tonight, I feel he's highly overlooked. Maybe we don't talk about him a lot, but his life is very important and he made a lot of sacrifice for Islam. His name was Hujr ibn Adi. Hujr ibn Adi was buried in Damascus, or in Syria, in a place in Syria. So, some historians, they actually say that he was a companion of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We see that Shaykh Abbas Kumi in the Fasl Mahmoom, chapter 15, he says about Hujr, he says, he was renowned for his abstinence, abundance of worship and prayers. It has been narrated that every day and night he recited a thousand rakat of salat. SubhanAllah. We have a problem making 17 rakat. This man is making thousand. And he was amongst the learned companions. Although of a less age, he was included among the noble ones. So. Shaykh Abbas Qumi is saying that he was companion of the Prophet, but he was younger. He was still counted as a Sahaba. In the Battle of Sifin, he was the standard bearer of the clan of Kinda. And in the Battle of Nahrawan, he was the commander of the right wing and the left part of the army of Imam Ali alayhi salam. These people were living in a very difficult time. He was living at a time when Shia were hunted. They were crucified. They were buried alive. We read the history, it's terrible. They would put the Shia in the walls of the building and seal them inside of walls. <coughs> building. 
they would destroy their houses. They would take them off the, the stipend of the treasury, take their money, make them poor, destroy their houses, and even banish them. We have a lot of people who went through a lot of hard times. Another companion of Prophet Amr ibn Hamak al-Khuzai, companion of Rasulullah, Prophet even prayed for him. As a, he made dua for him. He was stabbed nine times. His wife was imprisoned, even imprisoned his wife for being Shia. And they, he ran away from Kufa to uh, Mosul in Iraq, northern Iraq. And they severed his head and they brought it back to Kufa and put it, brought it into the dungeon where his wife was and put it on her lap. These are how treacherous the people are. They've been killing Shia, targeting Shia for it. It's not happening just now, like we see. They're still doing it now, Afghanistan, with the Hazara, Pakistan, all these other places. Uh, we're doing it in Syria, and so on and so forth. They have always been killing Shia for the love of Amir al-Mu'mineen, alayhi salam. All these people, they tried to get them to curse Amir al-Mu'mineen, but they would never do it. They would never do it all the way to the death. This is another companion, was killed by Muawiyah. Also, Juwayra Abadi, companion of Imam Ali, alayhi salam. Limbs were cut, was crucified on a date palm tree. Rushaid ibn Hijri cut off hands and feet. Imam Ali predicted, told him, they will cut off your hands and feet. So they said, how will you die? He told the, the Ibn Ziyad, my master said, I will have my hands and feet cut. He said, I'm going to prove you wrong. I will prove your master wrong. You go free. Let him go. Then. He said, no matter of fact, I call you back, and that's the best way for you to die. And they cut his hands and feet. And he kept narrating the maqam of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam over and over, all the fada'il of Amir al-Mu'mineen, over, even though they cut hands and feet, still doing it, until they severed his tongue and killed him. A lot of people went through a lot of things so we can have this beautiful religion that we have today. If they didn't make those sacrifices, if Imam Hussein salam didn't sacrifice his life for us, we wouldn't even know what Islam was. So, this time, the Hujra ibn Adi in Kufa, the governor, Mughira ibn Shu'ba, he got on the mimbar in Kufa and started cursing Imam Ali salam. Hujra. He's a lover of Imam Ali. He couldn't take it. He got up, jumped up, started admonishing this person, and began praising Amir al-Mu'mineen. So they got very upset with him. And uh, Mughira, this person, he ended up dying. And then Ziyad became governor. And he called Hujr to himself. He told him, I'm not going to tolerate the way that you treated Mughira. So he threatened Hujr with his life and he, st he practiced taqiyya and he started teaching in private gatherings. He would call people to a house or started teaching privately. So Ziyad found out about this. So what did Ziyad do? He made threatening tribes to intimidate all of those tribes that were associated with him to abandon him or they, he would punish them. So most of them did. And then the police, they came after Hujr. He went to the house of one of his friends, and the police came, all of them started coming, and then his friend went out to confront them, and Hujr escaped. He said he escaped through the roof. He went to other friend's house, he's on the run, they're trying to hunt him. For what crime? Only crime, loving Amir al After some days, he sent someone to Ziyad to plead with him, to say, just send me to Muawiyah and let him... Uh, make the decision in regards to me. So we see how bad Ziyad was. That, if you're asking someone to send you to Muawiyah to judge you, Ziyad must have been very bad, very harsh. So he agreed and he put him in prison for about 10 days with some other supporters that he had gathered. He watched them, he found those ones who would attend his group, his meeting. He gathered them all together and put them in the prison. So Ziyad sent Hujr and 14 of his companions. He sent them towards Syria. And when they reached a place in Syria called, called uh, Marj, Marj Adra, they were imprisoned at that place. Muawiyah, he made a decision. He said, I'm going to release six of these people. 
And as for the other eight, we'll do something else with them. So he released six of them. And the histor history books, they say, in regards to the other eight men, the messenger of Muawiyah said, Muawiyah has sent orders that if you disasso disassociate yourself from Imam Ali, and well, they just say Ali, if you dissociate yourself from Ali and curse him, then we will let you go. Otherwise, we're going to kill you and all of your companions. And the commander of the faithful, this is what they call him, Yazid, astaghfirullah, believes that shedding your blood is lawful for us due to the witnesses of the people of your town. But the commander has shown kindness. While if you disassociate yourselves from that man, you will be released. When they heard this, what did they do? They're facing death. Death is looking them in the face. They refused. They said, we will never curse our master, Imam Ali alayhi salam. So the ropes were brought for them, and the kafir, and the kafirs were laid out in front of them. So they rose that night, and they spent that night in Salat, worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At the dawn, the companions of Muawiyah, they came back to them. They told them, O oh, group of men, last night you made Salat, you, uh, you made a lot of prayers, a lot of dua, and now may we know your belief regarding Uthman. This is what they used to do a lot. They would say, what is your belief in regard to Uthman? To give them a reason to uh, say that they could kill them, that their blood is lawful. So what did they reply? They said that he was one of the foremost people who ordered unjustly and paved a wrong way. As we know, Uthman was not even buried in the cemetery of the Muslims. Now they have extended it, but back then they did. The Muslims didn't even bury him in the cemetery, so it was common that a lot of people didn't like him at that time. So they spoke the truth. They said, "The commander of the faithful knows you better." They're referring to Yazid. Then they placed their feet on their necks, the necks of Hujr and his companions. And they said, now they have the swords and their foot on their neck. Now do you disassociate from this man, from Ali? So think about it now. They're in the clutches of the death. Their face is on the ground. The foot is on their neck. The sword is over their head. And they said, no, never. I would rather what we do, we don't disassociate. Rather, we befriend him. They never gave up. They never let anything come in front of them, uh, anything from dunya, stop them from their love of Ahlul Bayt They didn't think about, oh my wife and family is at home, I left my business here, I did this, let me do, let me um, disassociate from Imam Ali and then I can go back and live my life peacefully. We have narrations at the end of time, in Akhir zaman that People were always calling, Allahumma ajjalla waliyak al-faraj. We're always calling for Imam. But when Imam comes, people will say, No, no, we don't need you here. We're living good life. Everything is comfortable. We, we don't really, we didn't really mean for you to come right now. Maybe you come another time. In these words, paraphrasing. Because they're living a good life. They're letting their dunya come in front of their love for Imam. So, when Hujr ibn Adi and his companions, they said that, no, rather we befriend them. Hearing this, each messenger of Muawiyah caught these people in order to kill them. They were ready to put the sword on their neck. Hujr told them, at least let me perform wudu and give me just some time so I can make two rakat. That's all I ask. He said, whenever I perform wudu, I have always prayed. So let me make wudu and just offer two rakat. I know this is end for me, just let me do this. They agreed, so they recited the prayers. After completing it, Hujr said, Wallahi, I have never recited such a short prayer in my life, but I did this so people don't think that I am afraid to die. I don't want them to think I make my, my prayer really long because I'm afraid of death. So he made the short prayer. Then he turned towards those who were present, what did he tell those people who were going to kill them? Did he cower down in front of injustice? No. He said, bring me along with these chains on my body that you have me in and the blood of my body because I want to meet Muawiyah on the highway tomorrow in Qiyamah. I want to meet him there with these chains and blood on my body. Bury me like this. 
So one of those people from Muawiyah, they advanced towards Hujr, and they took a sword to attack him. Hujr says he shakes a little bit. Says, Obviously, we may not fear death, but when the time comes, you may shake, even though you don't give up your beliefs. So he said, I th I, you said that you didn't fear death, so I give you another chance. Disassociate from your master and we'll let you go. Hujr said, how should I not fear when the grave is ready, the shroud is worn, the sword is unsheathed? He said, Wallahi, although I fear, I will never utter those words that you told me to utter, because I don't want to invite the wrath of Allah on me. He knows that if he disassociates from Ali, that he will bring the wrath of Allah on him. Also, at this time of his death, we find in some other books that it said that when they were about to murder Hujr, the time came for his death, they asked him according to the customs, like we said previously about Muslim Ibn Aqil, they came and asked him, what is your last wish when you die? So, they asked him, what is your last desire so I can grant it for you? You know what Hujr did? He asked them to kill his son in front of him. This baffled them. Of all the things you could ask for, maybe to free the other people, to, you know, whatever it is, let me go, anything send a message to my family, my wife, or anything. He said, kill my son in front of me. So they asked, what is the reason for this? They were all surprised. Why would you ask this? Hujr said that he would like to see his son die on the walayat of Amir al-Mu'mineen salam with it in his heart, and he was afraid if his son saw him get killed that he would get scared and go over to the side of Muawiyah and disassociate from Amir al-Mu'mineen. He wanted him to die on the walaya. Salu ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. So from this we could see that the importance. They went on and they did this. They killed Hujr's son in front of him and proceeded to kill him and all of his companions. But from this we see how much importance that love of Ahlul Bayt had in the lives of these followers. The last dying request, as we said, was just to be sure that his son died on this walaya. So we have to make a rigorous effort to teach our children to love Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, to love Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam, to make it a f the fabric and the core of our children as they grow up. We can't wait until they get older and start telling them. They have to know it from a very young age. All the way from birth, we need to be, they need to be seeing things, coming to Majlis. There is a barakat just in the air of Majlis. They say that Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam, they attend Majlis. There's things that you, we don't see with our naked eye in the Majlis, but they happen. And this environment is good for our kids to come. We have to raise them up on this love of Amir al-Mu'mineen, the love of Imam Hussein. <clears throat> and we have to show them the significance, the role that it has in their lives, so that they make this the focus of their life, and it make it's in their heart as they go throughout life. And they make these their guides. But if they don't love them, and they don't know about the love of them, and they don't know about the struggle, of what they, them and their followers went through so that we have this religion, they won't really appreciate it. Maybe they'll think that it's just something in the history books, but it's not. <clears throat> we see that it has a very big importance because the love of them was all that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked for the whole of the prophethood, of the seal of the messengers. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. We see that Ibn Abbas quoted the Holy Prophet saying, Cling steadfastly to the affection for us, Ahlul Bayt. For whoever meets Allah with our love in his heart will enter paradise by our intercession. By he who controls Muhammad's breath, the acts and deeds of his servant, 
will not benefit him except when joined with our recognition and our love. The prophet is giving us the key. He's telling us how will our deeds be accepted. Having ma'rafa and love of his family, of the prophet and his family, of Ahlul Bayt. We have to know about our Imams. We have to know about them. We have to know, try to learn about all of their lives. A lot of times we know a lot about Imam Ali alayhi salam. We know a lot about Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Maybe about Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. But the other Imams, the later Imams, we don't know much about them or maybe we don't talk about them that much. But the average Shia, they, if you come to them and ask them about Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, they'll be able to tell you a lot of things. But come and ask them about Imam Hadi, Imam Hassan al-Askari. It'll be very small, unfortunately. We have to remember them and learn about their lives. Because clinging steadfastly to their love is the key for us. That they'll come for us in intercession, that our deeds will be accepted. Sheikh Abbas Kumi, he says, in the Fasl Mahmoum, he remembered a tradition about Hujr ibn Adi. He said that Hujr went to see Imam Ali alayhi salam when Imam Ali was struck with a sword. He said he was wounded on the head by the sword of Ibn Mujam. He stood facing the Imam and he recited some poetry. Hujr said, Alas, upon the abstinent master who is pious, who is a brave lion, who is a virtuous door, Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, he looked at him and heard his poetry and he said, what will be your status when you're ordered to disassociate yourself from me? What will you do? Imam Ali alayhi salam, he already knew what would happen. So he's asking him, what are you going to do on that day? Now we see why Hujr, when they came to him, he never gave it up. Imam Ali alayhi salam already prepared him for this. Listen to Hujr's reply. Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, even if I am cut asunder to pieces and thrown into the blazing fire, I prefer it than disassociating myself from you. We have to ask ourselves are we in that position towards Imam Mahdi? Someone tells us when Imam comes to disassociate from him. Will we, be, will we be like Hajar and tell him, no, I don't care if you cut me to pieces and throw me in the fire, I'll never disassociate from my Imam. We have to take lesson from, the, from this. Imam Ali salam told him, he said, may you succeed in, accompl in accomplishing good deeds, Ya Hajar, and may you be amply rewarded by Allah for your love of the Ahlu Bayt salam. So we see Imam Ali salam praised Hajar ask that he be rewarded. He's praying for him. He will have a good status in the hereafter. Also, after Hujr was killed, we see that Imam Ali, uh, Imam Hussein alayhi salam, after a lot of these companions, some of the ones I mentioned before, Imam Hussein alayhi salam would write letters to Muawiyah condemning them for killing these companions of the Prophet because they swore that they would not kill companions of the Prophet. They made uh, treaties with Imam Hassan al mushtaba alayhi salam, and he was breaking the treaties one by one. The treaty didn't mean anything to him. The treaty was made so that it would expose him because he broke everything in that treaty. He said, Imam Hussein alayhi salam wrote to Muawiyah and he said, Are you not the murderer of Hujr ibn Adi al-Kindi and the other worshippers who resisted oppression considered innovations to be serious, to be grave, and who did not fear reproach in the way of Allah. You killed them with oppression and injustice in spite of offering them refuge. This was the way of Muawiyah, offer them refuge, make them feel safe, and then he would kill them. Imam Hussein is telling him that he's an oppressor. He's telling him what he's doing is wrong. He's standing up for justice for all of these people that are being killed. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa us to pay attention to this hadith. We don't get anything else out of this majlis. Just pay attention to this hadith. 
very important. Prophet says, pay attention. This is what he's saying. Prophet is saying this, pay attention. One who died having the love of the household of Muhammad has died a shaheed. He has died a martyr. Pay attention. The one who died with the love of the household of the Prophet has died exonerated and forgiven. Pay attention. One who died with the love of the Prophet has died having repented. Beware. One who died with the love of the household of the Prophet has died a mu'min, a believer, having complete faith. Pay attention. One who died along with the love of the children of the Prophet, the first thing is that the angel of death has given him glad tidings of paradise. And then after this, the angels, Munkar and Nakir, they come and give them glad tidings. He said, beware, one who died with the love of the household of the prophet has been sent to paradise, like the bride is sent to the house of the bridegroom. See how important it is that we have this love of Ahlul Bayt, that we build our life upon that love. We structure our life around this we have to have our priorities in order. We can't make our life all about work and about our job. This is important too, but don't make it the focus of your life. Because if you say, I'm gonna make the focus of my life my job, and I'll fit Majlis in when I can. I'll fit Imam in when I can. I'll fit him in my schedule. Astaghfirullah. Unfortunately, this is what happens sometimes. We have to put them at the focus. When we put Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first, we put Rasulullah and Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam first, Allah will give us tawfiq. Allah will make things work for us. It will go a lot better for us. We have to get our priorities in order and strive to be like these companions that will never abandon walaya no matter what. They're, they knew the most important thing in their life, in this earth, at their time, was their imam and they would give anything for their Imam, even their own life. And a night like tonight, we come and we remember another person who died on the love of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. This was his dear friend, dear friend of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, Habib ibn Madahir. Habib ibn Madahir, he didn't know where Imam Hussein was. He didn't know where he was at this time until a letter from Imam Hussein alayhi salam reached his house. At that time, he was having breakfast with his wife. Habib is sitting with his wife and his young son. Imagine sitting at home, you're wondering where your Imam is, thinking about him, and now a letter comes from him while you're sitting with your wife and your son. Habib opens the letter, he kissed it, read it and tears began to flow from his eyes. His wife said, what's wrong? Ya Habib. Habib said, I really received a, le a letter, a message from my master, Imam Hussein. He asked me to join him in Karbala. Yazid soldiers have surrounded him and they're after the life of my Imam. Habib's wife, she didn't hesitate. She said, Habib, your childhood friend has called you. Your master needs your help. What are you waiting for? Go, Habib, before it's too late. Look at this dedication of a family towards Imam Hussein, alayhi salam. The wife is not saying, stay with me. I want to be with you a little bit longer. Her, she knows that her Imam is in trouble. She says, go, help your Imam. Go now, what are you waiting for? He needs you right now. When Imam Hussein, alayhi salam, called out, who is there to help me? Habib answered this call. Habib went there. He was worried how to escape from Kufa without being seen. He instructed his servant to take his horse to the farm outside the city and wait for him there. This servant, he took Habib's horse to a farm outside the city and waited for him. Habib was delayed. He was trying to get out of the city. This servant of Habib, he started talking to this horse. He said, oh horse, Sayyidi, my master Hussein is in trouble. He needs help. 
He asked Habib to join him, yet Habib is late. O oh, horse, if he doesn't manage to escape from Kufa, I will ride on you myself and I will go to Hussein's help. At Asr time, most of the men were in the masjid, so Habib managed to sneak out. He reached this farm where his horse was waiting, and he quickly mounted his horse and said to his servant, Go, my friend. I'm freeing you from my service. What did this servant say? He said, Master, you're not being fair to me. I've served you faithfully for years. Now I have a chance to serve the son of Sayyid Zahra. And you're asking me to go? Why are you denying me my place in Jannah? Habib was taken aback by the words of this servant. He's pleased to hear that he recognized the difference between hawk and bottle, between truth and falsehood. He wanted to sacrifice his life for truth. He wanted to sacrifice his life for his imam. Habib asked his servant, get on the horse with me. Let's go. Together they went off towards Karbala. Habib reached there late in the evening. Imam Hussein alayhi salam, he saw the whole situation. It was very difficult for him and he saw Imam Hussein, and he greeted him with affection. He hugged him. It was his childhood friend. Come to his aid. Sayyida Zainab, she heard that Habib had come. She asked her maid Fidda, go convey my greetings to Habib. When Habib heard that Bibi Zainab sent greetings to him, he screamed out in grief. He threw his amama on the ground. He slapped his face. Tears rolled down his cheeks. As he spoke, he said, what a sad day. What has happened to the household of Sayyidah Fatima, Sayyidah Tinisa al-Alameen? Oh, Yazid, you tyrant, what have you done to the household of Sayyidah Fatima? The first nights of Muharram passed by, and then Ashura came. At dawn, after the, when time for Fajr came, Salatu Subh Ali Akbar went out, and he gave the Adhan for the last time. They say when you want to look and see the likeness of Rasulullah to look at Ali Akbar. They saw Ali Akbar go out and make Adhan and they still didn't care. It was as if they were going to kill their own prophet. Yazid's soldiers blew the trumpets and started the battle. One by one, Imam Hussein's companions went to the battlefield and gave their lives for Imam Hussein. Between Dhur and Asr time, Habib ibn Madahir came to Hussein. He said, Ya Sayyidi, Hussein, allow me to go to the battlefield. Let me sacrifice my life defending you. Habib, well, you're my childhood friend. Please stay with me and give me comfort. You're my friend. I don't want to be separated from you. Habib persisted with his request and he said, Please let me go. Eventually, Imam Hussein gave his permission and he helped his friend Habib onto the horse. What difficult situation. Your childhood friend you grew up with your whole life, you're seeing him going out to march to his death. Habib ibn Mudahir, he went out into the battlefield, he fought bravely, and he was finally overpowered and he fell to the ground. As Habib ibn Mudahir fell to the ground, an enemy soldier came over and cut the head of Habib. Wa Husayna. All the martyrs, the shuhada of Karbala, had their heads cut off, but Habib's was the first to be cut off by the enemy. Habib's head, it wasn't mounted on the spears like the other shuhada. What did they do with the head of Habib? Habib's head was tied to a horse and pulled on the ground of Karbala. Allahu Akbar. Later in Sham, Habib's head was tied to the horse's neck and a young boy called Qasim followed this horse wherever it went. One day the man on the horse asked this young boy, he said, why are you following me around? What do you want? He looked at the head hanging from the horse's neck and the man again said, why are you staring at this head? He said, this is the head of my father, Habib ibn Madhahir. Please give it to me so that I can bury my father's head. Habib's head seemed to look at his son it was as if he was saying, My son Qasim, you're thinking about burying my head, but what about the head of Sayyid al-Shuhada on the top of the spear? Ya Husayna, inna lillahi wa inna alayhi rajiun.
السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك عليك مني سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعله الله آخر الأحد مني لزياراتكم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين يا حسين Yo say, 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 yo